eFlight Expo, making aviation greener since 2009. Opens up a new world of possibilities, ending, enabling the movement of people, goods, and services across regions that were once isolated. This forces deeper collaboration and richer cultural exchanges. Number two, capitalizing economic opportunities. The introduction and development of green aircraft brings forth significant economic opportunities. Research and development, manufacturing, and the operation of these aircraft require a range of specialized skills and expertise which in turn creates job opportunities and drives economic growth. The opportunity to establish a new green ecosystem can stimulate technological innovation and attract investments leading to growth of associated sectors such as renewable and uh, fuel production, infrastructure development and maintenance services. By capitalizing on this opportunity, economic opportunities, we can uplift societies, improve living standards, and foster inclusive development. Number three, creating environmental awareness and participation. Green aircraft offers an impactful solution to combat climate change as we strive to reduce carbon emissions and transition to a sustainable future. The aviation industry plays a critical role. Green aviation, including hydrogen, when used as fuel, produces zero carbon emission, making hydrogen-powered aircraft an environmentally friendly alternative to traditional fossil fuel planes. This not only safeguards our environment for future generations, but also demonstrates the commitment to responsible and sustainable practices. The increased communal awareness of the merits of green aviation will incentivize corporates to participate through introduction of economic incentives such as carbon credit trading, allowing these corporates to offset their emissions through enabling investments in green aviation uh, technologies. The active participation in such environmental initiatives fosters collaboration, knowledge sharing, collective action, ultimately, hopefully leading towards a more sustainable future for our planet. In conclusion, green aviation possesses the potential to serve a formidable catalyst for growth and development, particularly in developing countries. Through embracing green aviation, we can enhance regional connectivity, empower local communities, economic opportunities for societal benefit, and fosters environmental awareness and practices. For this to have a meaningful impact, ladies and gentlemen, all of us have a collective responsibility to embrace the change agenda for a better and a greener future for all of us. On that note, I'm going to uh, conclude, but I'd like to also take the opportunity to play a short video, if possible. Okay, yeah, we can play the video, and we can already start you. If you have, if anybody of you has a question, please raise your hand, and we have mics here available. Uh, well, as soon as the video is coming up, so take the, um, somebody here. So just raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you until this is coming. Imagine soaring through the sky admiring an incredible panoramic view of a natural reserve. A serene lake, lush tropical jungles, and an active volcano, all in one magnificent journey. Welcome to the world's first electric plane ride up Mount Rinjani. Nestled in Lombok Island, the volcano is a popular tourism hub in Indonesia. At the summit of Mount Rinjani lies a turquoise oasis, the stunning and iconic Sagara Anak Crater Lake that is perfectly set amidst the landscapes of the volcano. With our electric plane, we are now offering a private, environmentally conscious way of adoring the breathtaking sceneries of Mount Rinjani. Because our aircraft is completely emission-free, we can access an ecotourism alternative to hiking that can help us all preserve the beauty and allure of Mount Rinjana. So prepare yourselves to indulge in a world's first experience like never before. This is more than a ride. It's a thrilling journey towards building a sustainable planet for our children and future generations. Mount Rinjani.
brought together by Volo, pioneering green aviation, and SPI, enabling green ecotourism. So, very nice dream. Now we have all to work on get it into reality. For this, I have a question to Jining. What about, you know, we heard that you, there is probably the most uh, viable, valid opportunity having long distance flight will be perhaps hydrogen. Um, what are the advantage and disadvantage in burning the hydrogen and then generating by the generator the electricity? Controversies to fuel cell. What is Rolls Royce policy? You mentioned this shortly in between, but do you think for burning hydrogen in a combustion engine or turbine there is a place you need this? Or do you think this will be only for a short while used and then will be taken over by running everything by the fuel cell? Actually, very good question, but it's a complex technical um, question, so there are pros and cons of both concepts. First of all, Rolls Royce is also testing large engines um, recently on burning hydrogen. So, let me give you an overall answer. So, for short term, um, we, we don't think that you can power large passenger aircraft with hydrogen for long on long distances. But the most viable approach probably is to use hydrogen as a fuel to burn it in engine. Okay. And in that respect, we want to burn hydrogen to power a tuba generator to generate electricity because you still have the low conver power conversion efficiency of our internal combustion uh, engine and then you need to convert to user electricity to power the whole electrical apparatus, which is also very weight um, intensive. Okay. So on a short range for this kind of commuter aircraft I presented for up to 19 passengers, we do believe with fuel cell you can have a solution for also for near term um, short distance flights. The advantage of fuel cell, now I come to this, uh, one is, for example, you have higher conversion uh, efficiency, like Michael said, up to 50% in comparison to 35% of an internal combustion engine, have high, higher uh, efficiency, however, you do have the disadvantage for heat rejection, also presented by Michael, but overall concept, we have performed various concept studies, we believe for this commuter segment, a fuel cell powered aircraft can be a viable solution as well. So, just a quick question afterwards, when do you think the first commuter aircraft with a fuel cell will fly fully electric? So, there are assessments from different if you ask different person, you're going to get different answers. So, uh, for example, EASA also published our roadmap where uh, for commuter aircraft, they forecasted if you use gaseous hydrogen tanks, um, our entry to service of 2027 may be possible. And we believe in that time frame between 2027, 2030, this should be possible. Okay, same question to Mike, because he is uh, he's, uh, doing surveillance on the market for a long time. Uh, what would be your estimate? And you work with companies like Zero Avia, you worked at Boeing, so what is your time estimation? When can we both fly, or when the first aircraft will fly? When we can fly, so when it will be in commercial operation, it's probably another, uh, will take another some years, but what do you think? So really, I think you will be able to buy a ticket to fly from Friedrichshafen to Frankfurt in a fuel cell powered airplane in 10 years. Okay, that's uh, good, but I'm not too old. I still can fly with an aircraft. Uh, uh, so, Carl, when do you, talking about time frames, what do you think your small fuel cell in an ultralight or Park 22 aircraft, when do you think I can fly it? Very selfish, I always want to know when I can try it out. 
uh, on, the, on the fully certified version uh, in three to four years from now. Yeah, three to four years. Three to four years from now. Okay. And again, question to everybody: uh, In which country of the world will this happen? Uh, maybe you should we start with uh, Mike, and then we go through. So. You're from America, you think it will be in America or it will be somewhere else? Uh, no, I think what I've seen is that countries like the United Kingdom uh, have been very progressive in putting a lot of government funding into moving hydrogen fuel cell aircraft forward. So I, I think you'll see it first in a country like the UK. Carl, because I know you work with companies here in Europe, you also work with companies in China, where do you think uh, it will happen? Uh, for our project, I think Germany, of course, yeah. uh, but it's a, a leisure aircraft, yeah, not a commercial aircraft. And commercial aircraft, I'm not so sure if Germany will be the lead, yeah, maybe you are right, it's UK, um, yeah, I'm not so sure. Same uh, chain, Rolls Royce is a global company, so you have your fingers in a lot of countries around the world. Where do you think it will happen first? So personally, um, based on my experience with various airlines, I, I do believe it's going to be happen probably first in Norway. Um, because there is a strong national policy to make the domestic flights um, carbon free until 2040, so it's an official um, national policy. And secondly, the geographic characteristics of Norway um, shows the, the, the flights, domestic flights in Norway are all very short. And based on this assessment, I think the first country should be Norway. That's my Okay, question. and Harry, what do you think? This, this is a loaded question because I think there are a lot of uh, potential uh, players in the space. Uh, we've been flying our aircraft, the two-seater electric versions, since 2015. And we've also been flying the four-seater since 2019. Now the challenge is always getting certification. It's much, much more challenging. Um, our hope and ambition is to get the four-seater uh, type certified for Part 23 sometime this year. And we believe that the prospects are for this aircraft then to be introduced to developing countries first. Um, in that respect, the developing countries have an ambition to, um, to adopt new technology in a much more uh, rapid fashion and more, perhaps a little bit more enthusiastic when it comes to adopting new technology. So after China, we believe will be Indonesia, and then the next path will be Africa. We already have an investment agreement with the Kenyan Investment Authority to introduce the uh, technology. But I think the point is whether we can actually make it economically viable on a large scalable basis is going to be challenging. Right? Because at the moment, to be candid, I think the battery cost, particularly for electric, is challenging. In the case of hydrogen, there's infrastructure issue, the storage issue. That, I think, Michael's probably right. It's going to take at least 10 years to get there. So there are a lot of challenges we need to address in order to get there. But again, I, hopefully, out of today's discussion, we can encourage and motivate everyone to work collectively to us accelerating that. Because the planet needs all of us to contribute in order to achieve that quicker, sooner, rather than later. Um, maybe uh, also a question of to whom you think, which government, I think uh, Michael mentioned this already, that in the uh, in UK, government is supporting this. I know that EU is also putting fundings in converting uh, this. Which country is the most pushy? Like you, you think Norway also to go to the hydrogen to a hydrogen circuit, also in aviation, or is there no company really, no country really has uh, realized it? So country, I think. Which country is government is has understood that it has to be done by this. So, I think we can take this also as the last question uh, for today. So, just your guess. So, 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 which... Why don't I kick off because I've got the mic and I can pass it on. So, I think uh, the country that will enable this to happen first will be a country that needs the aircraft. For us, we believe that uh, there is a big distinction from a country that wants it, i.e. they can financially afford it, 
to a country that has no alternative but to adopt it. So in that perspective, I think you see a more receptive um, uh, response from developing countries, in my view, on this space. So, um, from my perception, it's, of course it's not objective, it's rather subjective. I do believe Norway has a really strong push. There are various reasons. For example, they have very um, cheap electricity. Um, so, when I was there, the kilowatt pri hour price was 0.1 cent. Yeah, in the north of Norway, so they have, uh, they have um, water um, generators, electricity generators, I uh, and then um, make electricity very cheap, and also there is a strong drive of the government to make this um, real, so I, I do believe Norway is, should be a pioneer in this. Yeah, one thing which speaks for Norway also is that you're, uh, Harry, you're right that there may be countries who want it more, but you also have to have the money to, to, to afford it. In Norway, if you see, they have the largest state fund, which is uh, directing money to renewable sources. Uh, so maybe this could be, but Carl, uh, from what you heard, uh, which okay. I'm, I'm a policy? little prepared to this question, so I. I only can agree to what Ching Yu has said. Uh, I've been to Norway recently, and uh, if you see uh, their progress in electric cars, uh, yeah, I have. I think it's a good candidate. Okay. Yeah, I, I have to agree with uh, you know the idea that Norway has been really pushing hard. So uh, I've had discussions with their airport authority, who has set out a very clear vision for having all regional aircraft transport be electric powered within the next 10 years. So I, I think they really are pushing quite hard to, to be one of the first. So thank you for this and maybe we'll have an e-flight forum or an e-flight expo very soon in Norway and meet us all there. Thank you for listening. If you want to repeat, we will have a recordings on the websites and uh, Thank you, my guests, being here and giving us an insight of hydrogen in aviation. Thank you very much. Okay, now for the third e-flight expo forum, where we'll talk about different approaches to hydrogen in general aviation aircraft or at hydrogen in general as an energy source for electric flying because that's why what we need the hydrogen for mainly and uh, if you could go short to the second slide and then later back um, this is why I'm here and what I want to tell you because I know in a show normally there is a lot of things happening so sometimes you don't have time to stay until the end of a presentation what I suggest to you, look at one of the magazines. We have distributed them here in the one which is called E-Flight Journal, which we do since we do the E-Flight uh, Expo here. There is a guide which will guide you in the middle pages. One second, I take it. Uh, we've done this together with the Aerofare, and it guides you through all the electric which you find here on the show. Uh, all the sustainable aircraft and so you find all the points where you have some aircraft which you should look if you're interested in sustainable aviation and with this uh, can you go up I have, I have a point I can do myself and with this I go back to my panel I think it's a very interesting panel as we have approach to electric and hydrogen in electric aviation on a very different scale. So we have a small company which is, uh, I think, session two, I think, you know, there should be, should be another one which is called session three, because I think it's the wrong one.
slide. Sorry for this. Um, it was, uh, I did put in the wrong uh, PowerPoint in there. No problem. No, I can, uh, as I know my guests, I can introduce him. So we have Carl Kaiser from the firm Casero. He will uh, present on different fuel cell projects, or actually one fuel cell project they do for different aircraft. And you can have a look at this at the hangar A7. Uh, one of it, uh, they were winning a prize with the HiFly initiative last year. And I give the pearl to Carl, and he will tell you about what they are doing. Small ultralight aircraft, also with fuel cell and electric. So a lot of things in one. And uh, my name is Karl Kaiser, and I am presenting you today uh, the hydrogen fuel cell powertrain HiFly H167 uh, development of uh, Casero and PS Hightech. Uh, HiFly is an endeavor of Casero and PS Hightech. Casero is contributing to this uh, to, to this joint venture. Uh, its experience in aircraft design and certification and prototyping. PS Hightech is uh, contributing its uh, knowledge about hydrogen uh, fuel cell systems as well as its uh, um, unique high sphere spherical fuel tank, which I will show you later. So, uh, about the Highfly H167. Uh, powertrain. It's a modular powertrain from the fuel tank uh, to the prop shaft and it's uh, designed uh, to match the power, uh, the power supply of a Rotax 912 engine. As everybody knows, the Rotax 912 is the most common uh, engine in this small aviation and uh, so the Highfly 167 powertrain is designed to uh, be installed in uh, light aircraft, ultralight aircraft, light sport aircraft, VLA and motor gliders. This is how the, um, uh, the powertrain is uh, constructed. Yeah? Uh, the key is to keep it simple. We have the uh, spherical fuel tank, we have a fuel cell system, we have a booster battery for high uh, power phases of the flight, uh, and we have the control unit which controls the electric motor. So the advantages are, uh, of course, that you have zero CO2 emissions, we have a long endurance uh, and a long range, it's lightweight, I will uh, show you uh, afterwards. Powerful enough, safe and reliable, low noise and simple, simple in handling, uh, still affordable and uh, yeah, uh, it offers competing operation costs towards always growing costs of the fossil fuels. So here you see the installation in our demonstrator aircraft. The D is to see high. Uh, the aircraft uh, airframe is kindly provided to us by Domi Seedings. Uh, and you can see the demonstrator in Hall A7, booth 321. Uh, no. So this is maybe the interesting uh, slide for you. This is a comparison of the weight budget for Rotax 912 installation compared to the Highfly H167. A typical Rotax 912 installation weighs approximately 160 kilograms. Yeah? We will have uh, 75 kilograms for the Rotax 912. Then you have a fiber forward installation, including the firewall and cooling system and everything, which we have 
from uh, experience, average weights of 21 kilogram, few lines and fast uh, also depending on the design, several kilograms, up to four. The fuel tanks um, structure also depends on the aircraft, the average approximately 10 kilograms, depending if you have one tank or two tanks, how much it's structural or not. And uh, yeah, then we have fuel for four hours endurance, which is 50 kilograms. Compared to this, you have the um, you have the high fly H162 67 uh, system, <coughs> where we have the fuel cell system with a weight of 64 kilograms. The buffer batteries we need a minimum of 45 kilograms. This also depends on the aircraft. Motor and power electronics are 36 kilograms. Hydrogen storage is 35 kilograms, and the fuel itself is 7 kilograms. This leads to a total weight of 169 kilograms, which is not lighter than a Rotax, but close. So, Highfly uh, does not only. Um, supply or does not want only to supply uh, a, fuel, a power train to you and leave you alone. We are offering uh, also support uh, in the design and integration of the aircraft. We can offer performance calculations, weight and balance, structure layout work, maintenance assessment and of course support for the certification work. So. Um, if you are more interested, uh, please visit us uh, in our booth on A7321 uh, or tomorrow afternoon there will be another presentation uh, also here on the stage and yeah, I'm looking forward to meet you. Thank you, Carl. And uh, very interesting as we see that Again, the ultralight class could be uh, something which is really at the beginning of some ultralight because you have much less certification hair hurdles. So now we go from the quite small aircraft to somebody who will talk about much bigger aircraft and much bigger power motors as Kinin San from Rolls Royce. He is leading the commuter department there and uh, Rolls-Royce Electrical is supplying power for all different kind and size of aircraft and he will give us an update. Thank you. Thank you, really. Um, okay. So, um, I'm from Rolls-Royce, um, however in the business unit Rolls-Royce Electrical, so we are not electrifying the very big aircraft above 100 seater where Rolls-Royce engine currently is used for. Um, we start rather from the lower end um, of the aircraft classes for electrification. So as an example, the aircraft you see here is a, could be a typical 9-passenger CF23 Level 3 aircraft. This is the, currently the um, aircraft class we're working on and also derived from that also the power class of electric propulsion unit we are working on. So why we are doing this? Because we believe that electric propulsion will deliver unique um, benefits or advantages for the customers, for operators, and also for end customers, for us like passengers. Because it will deliver a cost-efficient solution and low emission and also make the utilization of very regional small airfield possible. And on top of that, there is of course also a noise issue, what we all, every pilot and every passenger will encounter, and also in the neighboring hood of uh, airfield, usually you have lower real estate prices. So with electric, if, electric propulsion, we hope we can remove this concern and so democratize the um, commuter travels. As you see here, um, our work share for this aircraft, for this kind of aircraft program, is usually the uh, what you see here, the green. Okay, okay. 
the, the green uh, NAS cell. Uh, behind that, well, our EPU will be hosted. And this is a real progress we're doing. So um, by end of last year, we have brought this the first prototype of our commuter EPU onto the test bench. You see here, this is a test facility in Norway, Tonta. And the motor itself is designed in Munich, Erlangen, and manufactured um, in Germany, however, shipped into um, our test facility in testing. And currently, the motor in Germany again will continue its work with more. We will test this motor extensively because we. This is a really an innovative design. Um, incorporate decades of experience based on our um, heritage, and to make sure all the design features or technology um, bricks work, we will test this extensively starting in April this year, and then go into the next design iteration provide a product into the commuter market. Current stages of our program and as further with you. Yeah, this is working. Um, so yeah, so we'll can ask more questions and details uh, later on because I asked to like always to have shorter presentations and then later we can uh, talk and you can ask questions on some subject. Our next speakers would be Michael Friend who has been talking here several times and he will tell you about what he thinks about because he's thinking I think about 50 years already about hydrogen in aviation or so. Thank you, Willie. So uh, there's quite a bit of material here, so I'll go through it. Hi, Doug. Uh, so I believe, and I've talked a few times about how I believe hybrids are the short-term answer uh, for electric aircraft, and I'll, I'll tell you why and why hydrogen fuel cells are, are one good possibility. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, why battery performance is really driving this interest in fuel cells for electric aircraft. I'll talk a little bit about the programs that are demonstrating fuel cells now. There are quite a number of airplanes that are starting to fly. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the way that we design and invest in these programs in a, maybe a more rational way to do that. So, um, this was uh, the first project that got me interested. It was the world's first manned hydrogen fuel cell aircraft. It was a project that I led, uh, and we flew for the first time in 2008. Uh, very successful program. So, it made me think about, you know, electric aircraft. Why is this really so hard? Uh, if we look out in the parking lot, we see electric cars everywhere. Well, the problem is the, the weight of the batteries. And the batteries are now good enough and light enough so they're very successful in cars, but they're just not good enough yet for uh, aircraft. So I've done some studies, and there's a magic number for battery performance, and many experts agree with me on this, and the number is 350 watt hours per kilogram. This is the level that it needs to get to before uh, aircraft can really uh, successfully operate in a commercial environment. So I have been tracking the performance of batteries for 20 years now, and about 15 years ago many battery experts thought that there was so much money being invested in them that the uh, batteries will improve at 6% per year. Well, unfortunately, this is not true. So, this shows the, the historical improvement in battery performance. And about 15 years ago, people thought that we would be able to follow this red line, which would mean that today, we would be in a perfect situation for electric aircraft. But unfortunately, it, it has not happened. So, that leads me to believe that a hybrid solution 
is, is probably the best way to start with, uh, with an electrified aircraft. So this is an How can you receive eFlight Journal? Just scan the QR code on the cover or on the promotion postcard or on the back side of the promotion postcard or type www.e-flight-journal.com in your browser and you receive the up-to-date blog site with the latest information from the world of electric flying or click on the top page and you receive the latest version of the PDF magazine either to read on your computer or cell phone directly or click on the link below and then you can download the PDF of the magazine as a offline magazine to read anywhere you want even without internet connection. Thanks and goodbye.